Woo, woo. That's all. We can't get no, no. Okay, okay, okay. So, listen. Um, so let's get, let's get straight to it with some of the questions, some of the things that the people have been, have been asking, have, have been concerning the, the heartbeat of our church, the why that we do what we do. Uh, Pastor Lindsay, can you, can you speak a little bit about, about the heartbeat of the church and, and some of the, the, the foundational reasons why we do some of the things that we do? That's a great question because it really helps to define the who and the what we are. Our motto is building lines for, for ministry. What does that mean? It literally embraces the idea that the church is not an institution because sometimes we really get confused on what the church, what really is the church. And we think, we look at it as this proud and noble institution, a building. So what happens if all of a sudden in America, because it's happening all over the world, what happens if one day Christianity is no longer a faith that you can practice out loud? What happens if there is something that happens that you can no longer participate in your faith publicly like you do now? If it is an institution and it's all about the building and about created systems that are already in place, what do you do when all of that falls apart? That's why God literally made the church to be an organism. That's why in the word of God, it is called a body, that we are a body, a living, breathing, uh, in intellectual and creative force. That's what the church is. She has the ability to change and to shift and to maneuver and to move. So whatever the culture does, we're able to respond to whatever the culture does in a way that honors God. But if it's an institution, if the government says no more, then the institution dies. Now you need to get this. You need to get this with everything that you are. That the church, that's why, that's why we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That's why, that's why we are to be all things to all men so that some might be saved. It is this flexibility. In other words, there may be some things that I really like, but because it does not honor God in a certain way at a certain time, I'm able to make a shift and it not impose itself on whether or not I'm worshiping or not. And so we really need to understand and we really need to get that is at the core of the belief of what the church is. It is not an institution. It is an organism that allows you to be creative, that allows us to be creative and not really care about a certain construct that does not allow us to achieve what God wants us to. So, so then if I'm hearing you right, so the emphasis for us then is to not place our anchor so much in the institution of the church, but our anchor needs to be in Jesus and who he is Amen. and our dependency and all that kind of, right? So that if yes, sir. that shifts, we'll still... Absolutely. Okay. Everything in this world changes. The only thing that doesn't change is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, let's, let's get that. That's all right. Go on and give the Lord a hand for that. The only thing that doesn't change is Jesus. So if Jesus is the only thing that doesn't change, change is really the order of the day for the believer. Amen. Amen. That if the moment you can no longer shift and change, you are looking at the death of the church. Yeah. All right. And everything that we do then points to that. Yes. And that's the why. Okay. Yes, okay. sir. That's the why. Okay. I love it. Now, Pastor True Love, you have been a champion of outreach, right, and reaching the community. You just mentioned the special offering that we're doing uh, next week for the outreach that, that enables the church to do what we do. Yeah. Speak a little bit about the impact we've already had, right? We're doing great things, but yeah. then what's to come in the future? Can you talk a little bit yeah, about, about sure, that? Sure, um, I think that um, our impacts that we had so far, uh, man, it's been so mind blowing. Um, one, uh, one story comes to mind, uh, who's been a part of City Union Mission before? Raise your hand if you've been a part of City Union Mission. Amen. Um, 
I remember one year we went to City Union Mission and we had a great worship service uh, led by Charlotte. And Damar always does a great job with that every year as well. And uh, Charlotte was leading a praise and worship that day. And it was uh, one guy, homeless guy, um, had on semi-dirty clothes, um, a little tattered, uh, wrinkled. Um, he was sitting there listening to her sing. And then he slowly stood up and just lifted up one hand and uh, began to weep, uh, began to cry. Uh, right then and there. And then so fast forward, probably toward the uh, end of that year, probably was like a year, maybe been a year or so. Um, but um, we're in visitor center, uh, shaking hands after service and in walks the same guy. But this guy had on a suit, had on some nice shoes, his hair was cut. Um, he smelled fresh and so fresh and so clean. Um, and clean, get, clean, 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 clean. And begin to talk to him, man. And he was just like, man, I was like, you were at the uh, event. He was like, yeah, I was, man. That was a day that changed my life. And I was like, well, what do you mean? How did it change your life? He was like, when uh, the lady was up there singing, man, she reminded me of my grandmother that used to lead praise and worship in my church I grew up in. And I was like, wow, really? He's like, yeah, man. And I just began to cry because my grandma would always try to remind me of who I was in Jesus. Mm. And that I was called to be more than just the average Joe, but God had a calling and a purpose in my life. And so he began to cry right there in the visitor's reception. And he said, that day changed my life, man. Y'all reminded me of who I was in Christ Jesus. So he said, you know what? I gave up my drugs. I went and got a job. I apologized to all the family members I hurt. Mm. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying this morning? Mm. And this man turned his mm. life around for Jesus, all because one day Concord packed up and went mm. to City Union Mission and fed some people and loved on some people. So... Um, that is what outreach is about. Um, and um, what, what the future holds and what we're hoping to do more of is we're still going to do the larger events, but we, I, we're kind of looking at outreach in a different kind of a way as well. I think some of the forefathers of our faith had it right when they would go into the community and yeah. live one-on-one -on -one and life-on-life -life with people. I've been hitting this neighborhood behind us every now and then and just going and asking random people how I can pray for them. and. Um, encountered, uh, I told a story not too long ago about a, a, a war veteran that we were able to help like that, but um, another young lady I encountered back here, she was outside with her kids, and all I did was ask, hey, how can we be praying for you? I'm from Concord around the corner, and um, she has four kids. All of them have different fathers, and all of them are under the age of 10. Hmm. Under 10. Can you imagine what that dinner table looks like, right? Mm. And so was able to talk to her and share Jesus with her and share how we're praying for her and then went and got her some groceries and loved on her. And let me tell you how important this is. When we went to get her groceries and brought the groceries back, the kids said, oh my gosh, we get to eat real bacon this week. Yeah, wow. <laughs> the kids were used to eating half pieces of bacon. And the kids were so excited. And her eyes were just filled with tears and excited because one church around the corner cared enough just to buy her some groceries. Mm, mm, mm. Then post that a few weeks later, she comes to church, <laughs> bring all her kids with her. They join church, all the kids all the join kids. church, right? Doesn't just stop there. Now she comes and brings all her kids with her and all her cousins and nieces with her, right? And they're falling in love with Jesus. And this isn't somewhere where we're going to do outreach. This is in our backyards. Mm. And this is why we go so hard about outreach offering. Because I wouldn't be able to buy groceries for this woman, uh, this mother of four, if you guys didn't give on that day. I can't walk in the price chopper and say, Jesus paid it all and walk out with groceries. <laughs> City Union Mission, we feed hundreds of people. That costs money. Yeah. And because of that outreach offering every year, we're able to do these amazing things for people who would never even. Mm -hmm. One thing I think is so powerful, and Pastor's going to talk about a little bit later, what made the first century church so powerful in Acts chapter 2, what made that church so powerful is that they didn't just have church in the building, but they took church to the people where they were. Yeah. And so that essentially, as a believer, as the body of Christ, wherever you go, you taking Jesus with you. Whether you're at Price Chopper, you taking Jesus with you. Whether you're at Walmart, you are taking Jesus with you. And essentially, we can be light to the world wherever we may go. So um, I thank you, Concord, for giving every year. And I pray that you'll continue to give as we uh, head into uh, offering this Sunday. So so, so, um, so it's good that, that you did that. But 
you can't be the extent of our outreach. Sure okay. so, sure so, so what you're saying is that that with the things that we'll be doing, there will be opportunities. Absolutely, yeah. like uh, folks. Absolutely. So, um, great, great point, Leonard. Um, one great thing that we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be doing a lot more small sales like that where we're able to do outreach, but on a smaller scale, but making massive impact. And you guys will be invited to a lot of that. Like DeMar Fletcher, uh, one of our new ministers here. Give it up for DeMar. DeMar does such great stuff here. <laughs> Ordained him a few weeks ago. This guy, he put together a small little code drive. Some of you guys contributed to that. He didn't do a whole bunch of commercials. He wasn't tap dancing with a sign out in the foyer or anything. He just collected a few coats, then him homeless and less fortunate and gave out the coats they prayed with people loved on people that is the heart of what we're trying to do yeah, yeah. that is showing people jesus yeah. it doesn't always have to be big and grand and we love doing big and grand stuff yeah. we're going to keep doing that but man we're trying to look for small little ways that every each and every person in here can be involved in outreach to some degree and brandon let, let me also add to that one of the things that we're praying about and that we're really uh looking at is opportunities on the blocks that many of our members live on. Amen. Amen. How do we do something on that block? How do we pick up trash? How do we yeah. do meet a need of a family? What do we do uh, to create opportunities to share Jesus and the gospel and how, folk, how to love on people? Uh, and so you are going to play a huge part in this. Uh, it is massive, it is hard, but brothers and sisters, if we can pull this off, if we can pull this off, and I know we can. If we can pull this off to the glory of God, yeah. just think about the people that live on the block that you live that we'll be able to help, not trying to get them to join church, right. but get them to know who Jesus is. Yeah. That's yeah. the way you change a community. Yeah. 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 And then when the Lord uses you like that, that changes the game in your own faith. Game changer, right. yeah. Right, I love it, right. I love yeah. it. Right. All right, Pastor, so listen, I've been here for a couple years. And I've heard this conversation many times about, about this intergenerational aspect of what we want to achieve, right? Yeah. Tell us a little yeah. bit more about that. Tell us the, the depth of, of your personal heartbeat and, and what we're trying to do in our ministry, this faith community, with intergenerational uh, ministry. It is the hardest. It is proving to be the hardest, the most complex, uh, the most tension-creating thing that I've ever done as a pastor. And I've been pastoring now here for 30, 31 years, all together since I was 21 years old. Wow. It is the most complex and the hardest thing. In, in America, when I was young, church was about 90%, or the Christian thought, or Christian thought was about 90%. Get that. 90% of how folk thought, whether they went to church or not. Right. How many of you, daddy didn't go to church, but he made sure you went to church. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was the core of what it is and how we thought, how we did what we did. Do you know less than 68% of people now even believe in Christian thought in America? That's how rapidly this thing is changing. And if we're not raising a generation of people who, and young people who love God, who understand the heartbeat of the gospel, who, who see it as a transformative agent that sees it as an organism, not an institution, we are going to lose the fight. The church in, in England is dead. I want you to get this, is dead. And if you're not raising young men and young women who embrace Jesus, through their creativity, you will kill the American church as well. Let me tell you why this is important to me. Uh, again, I've been pastoring since I was 21 years old. 21 years old. I'm 60 years old now. It's all I know. When I organized Concord, uh, uh, my father in the ministry, he and I had a great relationship. As Earl Abel, a great relationship. He gave me this heartbeat for community, this heartbeat to build, this heartbeat to do, do things that are so breathtaking. And, and it, though I may not take God's breath away, I'm trying. 
I want him to say, Lindsay, that was amazing what you did. I really, that is who I am. That's what I believe. That's the way I think. And it never will change. That does not change. But he and I fell out for a while. And there was a period of time I didn't have a senior male leader in my life to help me in some of the most critical times in the life of this church and in my own personal life. And I made some horrific decisions. What would it have been if I'd had somebody who would have said, Ron, I need to talk to you. Hey, what's, what's going on with you? You okay? Hey, that, that's not good right there. You need to change that. What I'm trying to say is, if young men and young women don't have senior people in their lives that can help them, that can love them through what it means to become a man and what it means to become a woman, they will miss the opportunity a lot of times and they will shrink instead of grow. Does that make sense? The other side of that is this. The world is such a different place. One of the most trans transformative pas- passages in the New Testament is in uh, 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 1 Corinthians 9 chapter. And Paul said, be all things to all men so that a few might be saved. Yeah. If you don't have, if, if, if senior folk don't have young folk to help them to weather where the culture is and what's going on in culture, they will make it all about the world that used to be and not what is. And you'll miss the opportunity to witness. Brothers and sisters, this is the hardest thing we've ever done. It is the hardest thing I've ever done. But just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not right. And so the issue becomes, how do we create the relationships to create leaders like Brandon, Janelle, Leonard, I look at uh, choir leaders now. Uh, uh, Andre has brought in some amazing young people like Mamie and Tristan to help craft them as we move our music ministry forward in an age that is so different musically than anything I've ever seen in church. But just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not the right fight. So brothers and sisters, That is at the core of why intergenerational conversations and relationships. And I really believe this, and and then I'll I'll hand it back to you. The most dangerous statement that can be made is this. To me, and this is my own personal thinking, I believe the children are our future. The future? If you're not teaching them how to lead now, the future will be very, very, yeah. very bleak. Yeah. Let, me, let me show you what, I, what I'm talking about. When I was young, the Niagara Movement had created this thing called the NAACP. Out of the Niagara Movement came the NAACP. And the transformative work that they did in terms of civil rights is breathtaking. Same thing with SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership. You know what happened to both of those agencies? They're still here, they're still alive, but you want to know what they don't have? Creative, transformative young leaders. Now I want you to get that. Great work in the past. But as we get older, and let let me tell you, these are not babies. (laughs) These are not babies. Brandon's a 36-year-old man that's been in ministry since he was in his 20s. Leonard's in his 30s. Uh, Andre's in his 40s. These are not children. These are grown folk who need the opportunity and the mentoring and the discipling to become leaders. And they are going to fail. They're going to mess some stuff up. But just because they do it doesn't mean that they're not doing good work. That's what it means to become a leader. I'm telling you, as a leader myself. Brothers and sisters, these are the moments that our culture misses. And some of it's 
a byproduct of slavery. When you don't start leading until you 40, 50, and 60, you ain't taking this from me. But when you're this age and trained and capable, we would indict God. This would be an indictment to our trust and our faith in God if we did not continue to form and create leaders out of the people that God has brought our way. Amen. Yeah. So, so for, for all of us in here, what you're saying is that uh, the older generation has a duty then to be intentional about pursuing relationships with maybe younger people. And then younger people uh, need to be open to stepping up, taking on more responsibility, and being receptive to those relationships. Absolutely. 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 It, it, it's a two-way street. Yes. Because what we normally see, and, and some of y'all know what I'm talking about, and if you know what I'm talking about, say amen. Sometimes old folk can run young folk out and young folk can run old folk out. <laughs> right. So the issue is not trying to run folk out right. to make, to give you relevance. Right. It's the fine space. Let me tell you what's happening in here. Sometimes it's hard for me to wrap my arms around some of the things that they suggest. But you know what I do? I work on it. I give my input. Sometimes we step away, then we come back and we deal with it again. Because just because we don't see eye to eye doesn't mean we need to break a relationship because we're not agreeing on something. Am I making sense in here? That's what real relationship is. Anytime you got to run because something ain't going the way that you want, I question whether or not you were really in it to be in relationship. Relationships work through difficulty, not run when things get hard. Right, 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 right. That's good. Well, listen, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of that, so thank you so much for this opportunity. I <laughs> uh, appreciate that. But listen, so these are the things. This is, this is kind of what drives us. This is kind of what we are building the foundation around. And so I'm legitimately excited for what's yeah. going on. Yeah. It's been a lot of good stuff since the two years I've been here. So it's good stuff. Thank you, guys. Give them a round of applause. Thank you for your transparency and candor for your vision. Now I'm gonna step away. The man of God is about to do his thing. What you need? What you need? You need a- I, I'm good, I'm okay. good. All right, what do you need? Here you go, doctor. I got my silver shoes, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Somebody say, I like them silver shoes. I'm glad y'all like them. I hate these things. But they, 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 they rubber on the bottom. So if I, I was afraid it was gonna snow and I wanted to be able to walk. Just wanna, for about 10 minutes. Talking about today. For a reason. Uh, it's not easy, but it's going to take spirit filled people with a passion to honor God. I don't mean just church folk, I mean folk who have a hunger and a thirst to honor God in whatever they do. Sometimes it's gonna go your way and sometimes it's not. But I got a passage I wanna share with you. So if you have your Bibles, look at uh, Acts, the first chapter. I wanna start at the fifth verse. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. For John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know uh, times and seasons which the father has put in his own power but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, 
here Jesus is really uh, uh, sharing prophetically uh, the power of the promise of God's spirit. It is the birth pangs of the church. It is a labor that is being experienced. Just as a woman experiences a child, the church is being born. It is coming to fruition. <laughs> and Jesus tells them, listen, what's been promised is about to come, so don't y'all go nowhere. Don't go nowhere. Not only does he say, that's going to happen, that's going to accompany the promise that's coming. He says, the spirit, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, that's all paraclete means. It means an advocate. It means one who is like an attorney that comes alongside you and walks with you through the complexities of life. Not just the emotions of worship. Oh, I love high worship. But just because you have high worship doesn't mean it's always spirit-filled worship. He says that when my spirit partners up with you, attaches himself to you, you will receive, and two words for power come out in this text. The first word is, is uh, authority. Power translates into authority. In other words, that because you are God's child and God's spirit is with you, this is sweet right here, you've got some authority that you don't know that you have. You know, most Christians, they, they, are, so, they are so in love with the humdrum, they never experience the breathtaking. The humdrum, they good with church. And I'm good with church, too. I love church. I love church. How many times have y'all heard me say, I can't wait? Well, I can't wait. I ain't going to say that. Because I ain't ready to die today. Matter of fact, uh, uh, we had all this food at, at, at my father's house. We had uh, chitlins. and Oh, be quiet, y'all. I know y'all don't like them. I don't either. Uh, turkey and... Uh, uh, all this, all this amazing food and desserts everywhere. You know what I ate? Salmon and I juiced. You know why? Um, I don't see a whole lot of fat men making it to 90 years old. <laughs> Y'all ain't with me. Y'all ain't with me. <laughs> So I, I want my days to go on a little bit longer. So I've dropped a lot of weight, but I'm going to keep dropping a lot of weight because I want to be around. But even if I'm here 100 years, let's say I'm here 100 years. Check this out. I got more years behind me than I got in front of me. Y'all better get this. I only have so many years to do whatever it is God has called me to do. And I don't care if I live to 100 or 105. That's a brief time in the expanse of eternity. Brothers and sisters, when you realize that your clock is ticking, how many of you know your clock is ticking? Look at somebody tell them, my clock is ticking. See, y'all scared of death. I ain't afraid of death. I really ain't, y'all. Look at somebody say, my clock is ticking. I'm going to do this until you look at somebody, so you might as well look at them and tell them, my clock is ticking. <laughs> so instead of wasting time, how do you allow God through the power of his spirit to embolden you, to give you the capacity to blow your own mind about what God does with you? That's what this text is talking about. Matter of fact, Paul put it this way, um, he about to die, uh, and uh, uh, he got this young man, and God had given him this breathtaking life. It is believed that he 
had rheumatoid arthritis because he had been in prison so much. Now, this is the same dude who murdered Christians. Matter of fact, in the Bible, it says that he held the coats of folk who stoned Christians. That's Paul, the one we talk about. The one we romanticize about, like these are all perfect people. No, these are messed up people just like me and you. And if it had not been for the Lord doing some amazing stuff. Check this out, check this out, check this out, check this out, check this out. He had, they believe he had crippling arthritis. Because he read by candlelight, because he was always in dungeons prisons underground. He would read and write by the moonlight coming through the cell. And he believed his eyesight was going bad. They believed that a part of his thorn in the flesh was his eyesight. And <laughs> it's arthritis. And because he was a Nazarite, some even conject that he possibly had been married at some point and maybe even had some children. That's conjecture. That ain't Bible, that's conjecture. Because he's a Nazarite, and that's what Nazarites did. And after all of this, hundreds, thousands, people came to Jesus in this amazing man's life. And this is what he said to Timothy, y'all. This is, this is crazy. He's on his deathbed. He said, Tim, I'm about to be poured out a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. That's what he said. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now stored up for me is a crown of righteousness which the Lord will give to me, but not only to me, for all those that adore his appearing. What I'm telling you is that the amazing life is available to every man, woman, boy or girl who trusts the Spirit of God to give them a transformative life where their children and their children's children and their neighbors and their friends come to know who Jesus is. All this stuff we talked about, uh, 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 blessing the community, for me, it's breathtaking stuff. What is it that the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart about for you? Forget about me. What is he speaking to you about your life? It will be a sad thing to make this life all about what you could have done. What you could have done. I think it's going to be some sad people in heaven. It's going to be better than going to hell. But you'll see all these folk with all these amazing rewards and all their accomplishments for the kingdom. And what will yours be? I'm going to finish by saying this. Living a transformative life is never easy. But brothers and sisters, it's well worth it. I just told y'all earlier today, I don't run from my mistakes. Don't you ever think I run from my mistakes? No, I don't have no secrets. Y'all need to know that. No, I don't just up and tell everybody my business. I don't have no secrets. I share my story. I share my testimony how God showed up and showed out. How when I utterly failed, God picked me up, encouraged me and gave me strength. And I've done more in life than I ever thought that I'd do. And it ain't done either. But what about you? Forget about me, what about you? 
You can make this all about church if you want to. I don't have no problem. I love church. One of these days, uh, my casket is going to probably be down here. Folk may come down, view that body. Yeah, I want that. I, I, want, I want to be, have my funeral in this church. I do. But even more, I want God to say, well done. I've never made, I've never made this thing about church alone. And I love church. But when you make this thing just about your church attendance, you're going to miss so much in your life. But when you use being a part of the church as the means by which God is glorified, and you create this legacy. That's when church membership is worth it. We're going to have prayer. I'm done. I don't know who you are. I don't even know what you're struggling with. But I promise you, if you give Jesus your all, he'll give you a life. Even the angels will be jealous of. But you got to give it to him. That's not to say it's going to be easy or perfect. It just says he promised, lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. I don't know who you are. I'm going to ask that we do this, and we're going to close. Now. I'm going to ask, if you're watching online, I'm going to ask, if you're capable, and if you're able, mother was here this morning, and I said, if you, uh, I want you to kneel by your bed or at your coffee table, and I want you to pray with, with us today, if that's you. If you're watching online, mother said, if you're able to get down, because sometimes you ain't even able to get out of your own bed. Am I preaching in here? I just want you to pray. For those of you who are here, we're going to have an altar call. And I don't want us to come up here and stand and hold hands. I want us to come to this altar and get on our knees. And I don't know what it is that's stopping you from God getting everything out of you, sucking every piece of you. I, you, you know, uh, I used to say, uh, uh, I don't want to die where the church done killed me. And I don't. But I do want it to be where God has sucked everything out of me he can. Gotten everything out of me that he can. I don't know what's hindering you, but I'd love for you to come to this altar. And I'd love for you to kneel down.